Good evening. Tonight we're reading A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain. Chapter 7, Merlin's Tower. Inasmuch as I was now the second personage in the kingdom, as far as political power and authority were concerned, much was made of me. My raiment was of silks and velvets and cloth of gold, and by consequence was very showy, also uncomfortable. But habit would soon reconcile me to my clothes. I was aware of that. I was given the choicest suite of apartments in the castle, after the king's. They were aglow with loud color silken hangings, but the stone floor had nothing but rushes on them for a carpet. And they were misfit rushes of, at that, not being all of one breed. As for convenience, properly speaking, there weren't any. I mean little conveniences. It is the little conveniences that make the real comfort of life. The big oaken chairs, graced with rude carvings, were well enough, but that was the stopping place. There was no soap, no matches, no looking glass, except a metal one, about as powerful as a pail of water. And not a chromo. I had been used to chromos for years, and I saw now what that, without my suspecting it, a passion for art had got worked into the fabric of my being, and was become a part of me. It made me homesick to look around over this proud and gaudy but heartless barrenness, and remember that in our house in East Hanford, all unpretending as it was, you couldn't go into a room, but you would find an insurance chromo, or at least a three-color God bless our home over the door. And in the parlor we had nine. But here, even in my grand room of state, there wasn't anything in the nature of a picture except a thing the size of a bed quilt, which was either woven or knitted. It had darned places in it. And nothing in it was the right color or the right shape. And as for proportion, even Raphael himself couldn't have botched them more formidably. After all his practice on those nightmares they call his celebrated Hampton Court cartoons, Raphael was a bird. We had several of his chromos. One was his miraculous draft of fishes, where he puts, in a miracle of his own, puts three men into a canoe that wouldn't have held a dog without upsetting. I always admired to study R's art. It was so fresh and unconventional. There wasn't even a bell or a speaking tube in the castle. I had a great many servants, and those that were on duty lolled in the anterooms, and when I wanted, wanted one of them I had to go and call for him. There was no gas. There were no candles. A bronze dish half full of boarding house butter with a blazing rag floating in it was the thing that produced what was regarded as light. A lot of these hung along the walls and modified the dark, just toned it down enough to make it dismal. If you went out at night, your servants carried torches. There were no books, pens, paper, or ink, and no glass in the openings they believed to be windows. It is a little thing, glass is, until it is absent. Then it becomes a big thing. But perhaps the worst of all was, there wasn't any sugar, coffee, tea, or tobacco. I saw that I was just another Robinson Crusoe cast away on an uninhabited island with no society but s some more or less tame animals, and if I wanted to make life bearable, I must do as he did, invent, contrive, create, reorganize things, set brain and hand to work, and keep them busy. Well, that was in my line. One thing troubled me along at first, the intense interest which people took in me. Apparently the whole nation wanted a look at me. It soon transpired that the eclipse had scared the British world almost to death, that while it lasted the whole country from one end to the other was in a pitiable state of panic, and the churches, hermitages, and monkeries overflowed with praying and weeping poor creatures who thought the end of the world was come. Then had followed the news that the producer of this awful event was a stranger, a mighty magician at Arthur's court that he could have blown out the sun like a candle, and was just going to do it when his mercy was purchased, and he then dissolved his enchantments, and was now recognized and honored as the man who had, by his unaided might, saved the globe from destruction and its people from extinction. Now, if you consider that everybody believed that, and not only believed it, 
but never even dreamed of doubting it, you will easily understand that there was not a person in all Britain that would not have walked fifty miles to get a sight of me. Of course, I was all the talk. All other subjects were dropped. Even the king suddenly became a person of minor interest and notoriety. Within twenty-four hours the delegations began to arrive, and from that time onward, for a fortnight they kept coming. The village was crowded and all the countryside. I had to go out a dozen times a day and show myself to these reverent and awe-stricken multitudes. It came to be a great burden as to time and trouble. But of course it was, at the same time, compensatingly agreeable to be so celebrated, and such a center of homage. It turned Br'er Merlin green with envy and spite, which was a great satisfaction to me. But there was one thing I couldn't understand. Nobody had asked for an autograph. I spoke to Clarence about it. By George, I had to explain to him what it was. Then he said nobody in the country could read or write but a few dozen priests. Land, think of that. There was another thing that troubled me a little. Those multitudes presently began to agitate for another miracle. That was natural. To be able to carry back to their far homes the boast that they had seen the man who could command the sun, riding in the heavens and be obeyed, would make them great in the eyes of their neighbors and envied by them all. But to be able to also say they had seen him work a miracle themselves, why people would come a distance to see them. The pressure got to be pretty strong. There was going to be an eclipse of the moon, and I knew the date and hour, but it was too far away. Two years. I would have given a good deal for license to hurry it up and use it now when there was a big market for it. It seemed a great pity to have to waste it so and come lagging along at a time when a body wouldn't have any use for it, as like as not. If it had been booked for only a month away, I could have sold it short, but as matters stood, I couldn't seem to cipher my way out to make it do me any good, so I gave up trying. Next, Clarence found that old Merlin was making himself busy on the sly among the people. He was spreading a report that I was a humbug and that the reason I didn't accom accommodate the people with a miracle was because I couldn't. I saw that I must do something. I presently thought out a plan. By my authority as executive, I threw Merlin into prison, the same cell I had occupied myself. Then I gave public notice by herald and trumpet that I would be busy with affairs of state for a fortnight, but about the end of that time I would take a moment's leisure and blow up Merlin's stone tower by fires from heaven. In the meantime, whoso listeth, listened to evil reports about me, let him beware. Furthermore, I would perform but this one miracle at this time, and no more. If it failed to satisfy it and any murmured, I would turn the murmurers into horses and make them useful. Quiet ensued. I took Clarence into my confidence, to a certain degree, and we went to work privately. I told him that this was a sort of miracle that required a trifle of preparation, and that it would be sudden death to ever talk about these preparations to anybody. That made his mouth safe enough. Clandestinely we made a few bushels of first-rate blasting powder, and I superintended my armorers while they constructed a lightning rod and some wires. This old stone tower was very massive, and rather ruinous too, for it was Roman, and four hundred years old. Yes, and handsome after a rude fashion, and clothed with ivy from base to summit, as with a shirt of scale mail. It stood on a lonely eminence in good view from the castle about half a mile away. Working by night, we stowed the powder in the tower, dug stones out on the inside, and buried the powder in the walls themselves, which were fifteen feet thick at the base. We put in a peck at a time in a dozen places. We could have blown up the Tower of London with these charges. When the thirteenth night was come, we put up our lightning rod, bedded it in with one of the batches of powder, and ran wires from it to the other batches. Everybody had shunned that locality from the day of my proclamation, but on the morning of the fourteenth, I thought best to warn the people, through the heralds, to keep clear away, a quarter of a mile away. Then added, by command, that at some time during the twenty-four hours... I would consummate the miracle, 
but would first give a brief notice, by flags on the castle towers if in daytime, by torch baskets in the same places if at night. Thunder showers had been tolerably frequent of late, and I was not much afraid of a failure. Still, I shouldn't have cared for a delay of a day or two. I should have explained that I was busy with affairs of state yet, and the people must wait. Of course, we had a blazing sunny day, almost the first one without a cloud for three weeks. Things always happen so. I kept secluded and watched the weather. Clarence dropped in from time to time and said the public excitement was growing and growing all the time, and the whole country filling up with human masses as far as one could see from the battlements. At last the wind sprang up and a cloud appeared, in the right quarter too, and just at nightfall. For a little while I watched that distant cloud spread and blacken, then I judged it was time for me to appear. I ordered the torch baskets to be lit, and Merlin liberated and sent to me. A quarter of an hour later I ascended the parapet, and there found the king and the court assembled, gazing off in the darkness toward Merlin's tower. Already the darkness was so heavy that one could not see far. These people, and the old turrets, being partly in deep shadow and partly in the red glow from the great torch baskets overhead, made a good deal of a picture. Merlin arrived in a gloomy mood. I said, You wanted to burn me alive when I had not done you any harm, and lately you have been trying to injure my professional reputation. Therefore, I am going to call down fire and blow up your tower. But it is only fair to give you a chance now. If you think you can break my enchantments and ward off the fires, step to the bat. It's your innings. I can, fair sir, and I will. Doubt it not. He drew an imaginary circle on the stones of the roof and burnt a pitch of, pinch of powder in it, which sent up a small cloud of aromatic smoke whereat everybody fell back and began to cross themselves and get uncomfortable. Then he began to mutter and make passes in the air with his hands. He worked him, him, himself up slowly and gradually into a sort of frenzy, and got to thrashing around with his arms like the sails of a windmill. By this time the storm had about reached us. The gusts of wind were flaring the torches and making the shadows swash about. The first heavy drops of rain were falling. The world abroad was black as pitch. The lightning began to wink fitfully. Of course, my rod would be loading itself now. In fact, things were imminent, so I said, You have had enough time. I have given you every advantage, and not interfered. It is plain your magic is weak. It is only fair that I begin now. I made about three passes in the air, and then there was an awful crash and that old tower leaped into the sky in chunks, along with a vast volcanic fountain of fire that turned night to noonday, and showed a thousand acres of human beings groveling on the ground in a general collapse of consternation. Well, it rained mortar and masonry for the rest of the week. That was the report, but probably the facts would have modified it. It was an effective miracle. The great bothersome temporary population vanished. There were a good many thousand tracks in the mud the next morning, but they were all outward bound. If I had advertised another miracle, I couldn't have raised an, an audience with a sheriff. Merlin's stock was flat. The king wanted to stop his wages. He even wanted to banish him, but I interfered. I said he would be useful to work the weather and attend to small matters like that and I would give him a lift now, and then, when his poor little parlor magic soured on him. There wasn't a rag of his tower left, but I had the government rebuild it for him, and advised him to take borders, but he was too high-toned for that. And as for being grateful, he never even said thank you. He was a rather hard lot, take him how you might, but then you couldn't fairly expect a man to be sweet that had been set back so. That's the end of chapter 7. Come back tomorrow and we'll read Chapter 8, The Boss. Mm -hmm.